Ultimately, there are far greater novels that are not nearly as entertaining. Better than food, man. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. Mmm. Beautiful morning out there. If you enjoyed this review, please subscribe and hit the thumbs up. It helps out with just about everything. I'd also like to bring to your attention this beautiful first edition of Don Carpenter's Hard Rain Falling that we have in the Better Than Food bookstore. Link below. You can check it out. It's definitely not cheap, but it is worth every penny. Look at this. A really fantastic first edition. I highly suggest you check it out. If you've never read Hard Rain Falling, it's an excellent book. Kind of a 60s crime novel. Takes place in Portland, Oregon and up and down the West Coast. Very, very unusual book. I really enjoyed it. If you're interested, please check it out. Thank you. Okay, so long time coming on this one. Today is The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, published in 1890. Oh man, first time for me. I can't believe it took me this long to read Oscar Wilde's masterpiece. In fact, I'm embarrassed to say this is my first Oscar Wilde ever. Don't know what happened. Time flies and all of a sudden you're 33 and you've never read an Oscar Wilde book before. Yeah. I've seen a performance of The Importance of Being Earnest, which I thought was very funny at the time. You know, cucumber sandwiches and Bunbury and all that. But you know, I feel like this was the perfect trajectory because I've read many of Wilde's influences leading up to this novel, which out of all the books I've read associated with it is obviously by far the most popular. Dorian Gray, that is. If you've never had the pleasure of reading Oscar Wilde, uh, let's see how to put it. If a man's wit could kill, Wilde would have surpassed Genghis Khan. The Irish author Oscar Wilde was uh, predominantly, I believe, a playwright, a uh, poet, but, uh, but mostly a playwright. And, uh, you know, very, very uh, famous for his aphorisms, declarative, clever lines. This was Oscar Wilde's only novel, one about obsession, beauty, youth, aging, love, the desire for love and to be loved, uh, coupled with the impossibility of actually loving anyone, identity, guilt, morality. That all results in a misanthropic solitude and heavy psychological distress for its main character, Dorian Gray. Speaking of psychological distress, these are certainly psychologically distressing times. And so I'd like to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, BetterHelp. During hard times, such as these, that we're all living in right now, it can get really difficult if you don't have anyone to talk to. Sometimes you have friends and family to speak with, sometimes you have a spouse, sometimes you don't. And hey, I've been there. There are some times where it feels like you just have to suffer in silence, and that's just simply not the case. No matter if you have a wife or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a husband, if you don't have any of those, if you have no family, if you have a whole bunch of family and friends but you can't talk to any of them, everybody's situation is different. But there's no need for you to suffer psychologically because you can't talk to someone. Being alone with your thoughts, all alone, can be an isolating feeling that can allow negativity to consume you. This is why I am sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp has customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat services with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. There is a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's 20,000 therapist network that gives you access to help that may not be available in your area. You just fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs, and then you get matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Then you schedule secure phone and video sessions, plus you can exchange unlimited messages, and everything you share is completely confidential. Also, you can request a new therapist at no additional charge anytime. So join the 2 million people plus who have taken charge of their mental health with an experienced BetterHelp therapist. So many people use BetterHelp that they are currently recruiting additional therapists in all 50 states. Get 10% off your first month by going to betterhelp.com forward slash BTF. The link is below. There's really no need to suffer in silence. Thanks so much for your consideration. And if you have a friend or family member who might benefit from it, if you would pass it along, I sincerely appreciate it. Thanks so much. So the picture of Dorian Gray starts off as a, a kind of like a, a foppish romantic comedy of manners, almost like a Ernest. Then turns into like a darker, decadent, Baudelarian, fin de siècle novel before finally propelling into the abyss as a gothic, almost like Edgar Allan Poe horror story. It's a real amalgamation. It's a, it's a real, it's taking from so many different places. It doesn't always work, but that, that's also kind of its, um, its appeal and unique flavor. It also displays the callousness of the, the British upper crust. And so in a way also, you know, operates as this kind of uh, social critique. It takes place in the circles of British aristocracy and the men of uh, privileged leisure. Basically, these guys sitting around all day and discussing art and philosophy and beauty, making witty puns, eating, seducing, criticizing, socializing, and doing a very great deal of fuck all. This man named Basil Halward is a painter and has found himself obsessed with a beautiful foppish young man named Dorian Gray, who appears to be the quintessence of youthful beauty. So Basil draws his portrait. But inside this portrait, he puts in something of himself, as he alludes to his aristocratic cynical friend, Lord Henry, 
in the beginning. Too much. Too much of himself. Too much of something. That part's never explained. That's kind of the, uh, the, the magical realist uh, stretch here. So he shows the portrait to Dorian, and this triggers the most famous case of narcissism in the history of literature. Dorian realizes he's beautiful and wants to remain so forever. And somehow, in this kind of vampiric way, due to the nature of this painting, this special painting, he does. Instead of aging, his portrait ages. And heavily influenced by Lord Henry, much to the chagrin of Basil, as Dorian descends further into the kind of Rimbaudian, Baudelarian, Dionysian, and eventually satanic realms, his portrait increasingly displays the corruption and cruelty in his face and features. But his face, his real face, always remains young, always remains beautiful. Nothing changes, just the portrait. So he hides it away, he sequesters it, and uh, keeps it in like an attic. It's interesting to know that Wilde and Rimbaud were born the same year. But this can't last, of course, and things begin to fall apart. What results is manipulation, suicide, murder, opium, revenge, blackmail, and the proverbial shitload of witty banter from Lord Henry. It's kind of all over the place. It's clunky, it's weird, it's dark, it's bizarre. Disjointed, indulgent, extremely indulgent. At times, it's like a G-rated version of the Marquis de Sade's philosophy in the bedroom, where Dolvancé goes on one of his crazy tirades again, you know, that, which is like interspersed between uh, that and the hardcore sex. Instead of some extremely depraved sex. There's just a bunch of Wildean banter and emotional outbursts. Who knows, maybe it could have maybe it could have used more sod. Wilde probably put it in there but then had to take it out because he was in hot water already as we'll soon find out. And the publication of this book I believe was um, not a scandal but but produced some outrage and criticism. But all the homoeroticism which as any of us could guess the novel is flooded with is alas subdued uh, at, le at least compared to sod. Its tonal shift is one of the major refreshing things about the novel, but what's of course iconic and the reason to read it is Wilde's iconic and iconoclastic aphorisms, or his one-liner quips, some of which are actually recycled from other works of his. And many of them are placed in, in the dialogue scenes near the beginning of the novel, uh, almost in rapid succession one after the other. You're going to recognize a lot of them, at least I did. Ultimately, there are far greater novels that are not nearly as entertaining. And I'd wager of all the great novels, none of them will be as charming. One of the most interesting things about the novel, for me, is the, uh, uh, the obsession of Dorian, uh, or, or what triggers it, basically, or, or kind of propels him further. Uh, this gift from Lord Henry, a book, a poisonous book. This book in the novel that is never named, but is actually a real book. The book is Against Nature by J.K. Wiesmont, one of my favorites. I did a terrible review of it years ago. It's more of just me on camera stumbling over words and not understanding what I just read, but having clearly loved it. I will re-review it. It's around here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, this one. God, that's a good one. Dandy, dandy extraordinaire, right? Love that book. Against Nature is a tale of this decaying dandy des Essentes, the very last in line of this uh, aristocratic bloodline, who has sequestered himself in his own artificial world, filled with rare and eccentric objects in his, in his uh, I think it's a farmhouse in the countryside, in a kind of sick and grand attempt to replicate nature or the natural world through gaudy, decadent, and unnatural means. And so there's just lists and lists of all kinds of things like references to authors and art and jewels and stuff. And so in an homage, Wilde writes about Dorian's obsession. It, it takes on the exact same tone and style of against nature. And uh, so there's just lists of things that Dorian's obsessed with. And so you have references everywhere just piled on, an excessive, decadent deluge. But then it flips back to like the comedy of manners. And then it goes into like the, the Poe story, right? That is a very odd book. It's just like, what is going on? That's the part about which I'm going to read. Just because it's my own personal obsession too. His eye fell on the yellow book that Lord Henry had sent him. What was it, he wondered. He went toward the little pearl-colored octagonal stand that had always looked to him like the work of some strange Egyptian bees that wrought in silver, and taking up the volume, flung himself into an armchair and began to turn over the leaves. After a few minutes, he became absorbed. It was the strangest book that he had ever read. It seemed to him that in exquisite raiment, and to the delicate sound of flutes, the sins of the world were passing in dumb show before him. Things that he had dimly dreamed of were suddenly made real to him. Things of which he had never dreamed were gradually revealed. Yeah, so the book basically ruins Dorian and he blames uh, Lord Henry. And it's interesting. It was almost nine o'clock before he reached the club where he found Lord Henry sitting alone in the morning room looking very much bored. I'm so sorry, Henry, he cried, but really it is entirely your fault. 
That book you sent me so fascinated me that I forgot how the time was going. Yes, I thought you would like it, replied his host, rising from his chair. I didn't say I liked it, Harry. I said it fascinated me. There is a great difference. Ah, you have discovered that, murmured Lord Henry. And they passed into the dining room. Yeah. And that's very much the, the case with Against Nature. It's one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. You know, advocating the picture of Dorian Gray, at the same time, I would really like to advocate for that book as well, because it is a masterpiece. It is one of my top 10 books of all time. It is one of my favorite books. Just the, the nature of it and the style of it, it's very unique. Uh, there's nothing like it. It's exhilarating, but then you kind of like read it or you step back and think about it and you're like, well, how is it exhilarating? It's really just like lists of stuff. And it's like this weird dude, like just talking about the things that he loves. And you know, this kind of weird, weaselly, dandy character. It's like, why is this so powerful? Why is this so strong? I don't know. It has something to do with the interior life and the celebration of art and excess and, and the descent into obsession with beautiful things and maybe beauty itself. I'm not sure. I have to think about it a little more. It's a great book. Yeah, so he hides this portrait and lives the illusion of his youth. Meanwhile, the hidden portrait shows the true degradation of his life. But as one could guess, eventually Dorian can't stand it anymore and decides to destroy his portrait. But is it just a portrait? Is it not actually himself? You know, ironically, I was sent this portrait from a very kind fan recently. Thanks a bunch, Ryan. I really appreciate it. The Irish author Oscar Wilde barely needs an introduction. No matter what you think of him, there's always an element of surprise. It's written on Wikipedia that uh, when he was younger, he scorned manly sports, right? Except he occasionally boxed. It also said that he was once attacked by four young men, maybe a more common and horrific occurrence for gay men back in the day, but that he took them on, all of them, by himself. Everything about Wilde contains the element of surprise. He was a beautiful animal of the rarest kind an Irish poet, playwright, novelist, who died far too young after being publicly humiliated in a trial wherein he was convicted for his homosexual behavior, which they called at the time, I think he was convicted for gross indecency. What I didn't realize uh, before researching it was that uh, I believe he was actually trying to take legal action for libel, but it backfired on him and resulted in the worst possible outcome I think I've ever heard of. He was in prison for almost two years, I think, and then transferred during that time to various penitentiaries and on the night of his release, he fled to France. He got the fuck out of there. And he changed his name to Sebastian Melmoth, which was a reference to uh, Melmoth the Wanderer, which was a Gothic novel written by his great uncle by marriage, Charles Maturin. I have Melmoth the Wanderer somewhere around here. Uh, I haven't read it yet, um, but I'm told it's very good. It's a big book too, it's a big, thick book. Sebastian, if you hadn't guessed, refers to the same saint that obsessed Yukio Mishima half a century later. Mishima was massively influenced by uh, Wilde's illustrated play, Salome, which was uh, written in French, actually. Gustave Moreau's painting of Salome with the severed head of John the Baptist actually graces a cover of an edition that I had of uh, uh, Wiesmann's Against Nature as well. Uh, beautiful edition. You start to get the feeling when researching all these things that nothing dies, but is rather just transmuted. Everything and everyone just changes form. And that's what we've come to call time. Oscar Wilde died at 46 from meningitis in exile after converting to Catholicism, which was kind of a trend at the time, just like Wiesmont. This was kind of a fan de siècle trend, apparently, like converting to Catholicism right before you die. But yeah, terrible tragedy. One of the most famous in literary history, I think. Uh, and his grave is infamous in Paris because uh, it's uh, <laughs> covered in lipstick uh, from the kisses of fans. And they had to, it's a giant sphinx. I've been to it in uh, Père Lachaise. Yeah, yeah, it's this beautiful sphinx statue. They had to put like these plastic wall around it. It's really funny, which is also just mired in lipstick and writing and all these things. And yet he left us with perhaps the best last words we've ever heard. Referring to the horrific decor of his Parisian flea bag hotel room where he was spending the last days of his, his uh, tragic impoverished life, he reportedly said, this wallpaper and I are fighting a duel to the death. Either it goes or I do. And then he died. In life as well as death, nothing Oscar Wilde did was mediocre. His influence is vast. But Wilde wasn't about legacy, right? Wilde was about living. He and his works, just like all of us, may disappear after several generations. But what he represented, his essence, his kind of poisonous, complex joie de vivre, his punk rock soul, though broken maybe by the end of his life, is immortal. Better than food, without question. So what did I dislike about it? 
Well, look, I mean, it's purple as hell. I mean, it's a book of effete men dealing with tempestuous emotions and falling upon divans in tears. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's completely ridiculous. It's a very particular aesthetic leaning, right? That is flagrantly, almost ostentatiously, homoerotic. It's gay as hell. Ambrose Bierce, the notoriously scathing American literary critic and author, who, you know, disappeared after he went to go and join the Mexican Revolution uh, in his 70s, writing about Wilde when Wilde did a, a lecture tour of the United States, called him, called Wilde, the sovereign of insufferables. So, yeah, you know, I mean, it's like, it's a very particular tone. It's a very, very particular voice and flavor. If you're into it, then you're into it. If not, you're gonna, you're gonna hate it. But that's fine. I think it's fucking great. Even if structurally, it's kind of like, what the, what the hell is this? You know, <laughs> it makes no sense. There's a lot of artifice, you know, it's not realism. Uh, there's truth inside of it. There's shitloads of truth inside of it. But it's, it's almost, um, surreal. It's almost proto-surrealist in a way, which is great, you know, because I mean, he was, he was on that whole trip before like anybody in the twenties and thirties. So bully for him. So you should read it. Well, if you're a fan of British humor and wit, I mean, Noel Coward, I mean, look no further, but you're also a fan of J.K. Wee's mom, Baudelaire, and Yukio Mishima, don't hesitate for a second. It's central reading. And there are plenty of Shakespearean references as well. There's, there's tons of references in this book. Down the rabbit hole, gateway drug, you know, it's just a great way to get recommendations and, uh, and uh, explore the new paths that open up before you in literature and art and otherwise. So yeah, highly recommended. <sighs> Coffee time. For those of you who are new, I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show. I place their names in this mason jar, and for every review I do, I pull out a name, and whoever's name I pull out is sent a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. And the coffee is delicious. If you'd like to help support the show, I sincerely appreciate it. You can do that by clicking on the link below, or going to patreon.com forward slash better than food and donating $5 or more per video. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. For donating a dollar or more, you'll get access to the patron-only reviews, the Discord channel, plus the Better Than Friday newsletter that I send out every Friday, which is just a list of five different things I'm interested in at any given time. Could be books in the pipeline, music, films, changes week to week. If you think we have similar tastes, I think you'll really enjoy that. Unfortunately, international shipping is not included. Sorry about that. Thank you very much to all the patrons and best of luck. Okay, here we go. Alex, Alex M. Thank you so much, Alex. Sincerely appreciate it. You're going to receive The Portrait of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, plus a bag of delicious coffee, and I hope you love both. Thank you so much. Well, that is all I've got for you today. Please subscribe if you have not already, and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this, and always remember, bring a book wherever you go. All right, take care of yourselves. Have a great night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.